3 p.m. The date today is Monday, January 8, 2018. I call to order this meeting of the Goose Creek CISD Board of Trustees. Before proceeding with tonight's activities, I would like to remind everyone in attendance that the meeting is being recorded through video and audio technologies. At this time, I ask that everyone silence or turn off all electrical devices. Thank you very much. Mr. Laredo, was this meeting properly posted? Yes, it was. And do we have a quorum? Yes, we have all members present except for Mr. Sampson. Okay, six are present. Thank you very much. We will now have opening exercises. Dr. Duarte. President Richard, school board members, Mr. O'Brien. The opening exercises for the January 8, 2018 board meeting will be presented by students from Cedar Bayou Junior School. We will begin the opening ceremonies with the prayer led by Augustine Laredo. Everyone, please rise. Please bow your heads and join me in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for giving us the opportunity to come to our meeting this year. Thank you for allowing us to live through another year and starting this great 2018. Please bless our teachers and students and staff as they come back to school to begin a spring semester. Help us have the diligence and the guidance to continue to do the good work that we have set out for our children to do. We ask you to look over all our families and we ask you to give us a blessed year. We ask this in your name. Amen. The pledges will be led by Dahlia Cifuentes and Mariah Locke. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the once one state under God, one and indivisible. You may be seated. <coughs> the following students will perform Sahara Crossing. With us today from Cedar Bayou Junior School are Faith Cano, Olivia Cantu, Jillian Delgado, Crystal Garcia, Leanne Hawkins, Katie Johnson, Jordan Kakashis, Mariah Locke, Janice Martinez, Juan Sagastume, Leon, Mariana Salinas, Dalia Cifuentes, Damaris Cifuentes, Crystal Smith, Aaron Valagomesa, and Gabriel Valagomesa. Students are under the direction of Nicholas McMurray and their principal, Michael Curl.
have a question. Raise your bull if you're a three-year orchestra student. Thank you. Very good. Very good. I was just two, two and a half years in the program. Fantastic. Would the parents of these students please stand up and be recognized? My parents? Thank you very much. We will let you all exit now. Next, I would like to introduce Christy Leaf, our Director for Advanced Academics and Special Projects, who will be recognizing our largest number of AP scholars that we've ever had identified. Here you go, Christy. All right. Uh, good evening. Based on the 2017 Advanced Placement Exam Administrations, 94 Goose Creek students were named AP Scholars, and this is a record-breaking number for the district. It's the most we've ever had. Earning this designation of AP Scholars a huge accomplishment, so let's give all 94 students a huge round of applause. <laughs> the College Board recognizes several levels of achievement based on the number of AP exams taken and scores achieved. The levels of achievement that we'll be recognizing tonight are AP Scholar, AP Scholar with Honor, AP Scholar with Distinction, and National AP Scholar. Our academic deans from each high school will be introducing the students. Academic deans are Ms. Christy Spites from Goose Creek Memorial, Ms. Kim Fox from Robert E. Lee, and Ms. Renee Cosby from Ross S. Sterling. I'd also like to recognize the principals who could be with us tonight, Mr. Nathan Chaddock, wherever you are, from Ross S. Sterling, I know I saw you, Mr. Chaddock, and also Dr. Joe Farnsworth from Robert E. Lee. Tonight, now let's give them a big round of applause. Okay, tonight we'll only be recognizing the students who could be with us. And we'll also be recognizing uh, the parents who are here to accept the plaque on behalf of their child, if they couldn't be with us tonight. And many of the students who are present with us actually are in their first year of college. Anybody? Raise your hand if you're in your first year of college. Welcome back to the district. Thanks for being here. Okay, students, when your name is called, you're going to come forward for an individual picture and then remain at the front for a group picture. Parents or guardians, as well as family members, please stand when your student's name is called. And we'll begin by announcing the level of achievement termed AP Scholar. During the 2017-18 school year, 63 students throughout the district qualified for the AP Scholar Award by completing three or more AP exams with scores of three or higher. All right, Christy. Okay. The AP Scholars from Goose Creek Memorial High School who are present tonight are Gabriel Kabikas, Gabriel is a junior and plans to attend University of Texas majoring in computer engineering. She scored a three or higher on three exams. Gabrielle is the daughter of Rama and Ray Kabikle. <laughs> Next is Jonna Janobas. Jonna is attending Lee College majoring in nursing. She scored a three or higher on five exams. Jonna is the daughter of James and Mary Ann Janobas. <laughs> Let's
Let's give our GCM AP scholars who could be with us tonight another big round of applause. Sorry. Sorry, we left one off. I'm so sorry. She was on it. That's my fault. I didn't read it. The next one is Courtney Riffle. Courtney is attending Texas A&M, majoring in education. She scored a three or higher on four exams. Courtney is the daughter of Matt and Tracy Riffle. Yeah. Good evening. The AP scholars from Lee High School that are present tonight will start with Robert Archibald. Robert is a senior and please attend UT at Permian Basin. He's going to major in engineering. He scored three or higher on three exams, and Robert is the son of Robert and Stacy Archibald. <laughs> Next, we have Miss JC Farnsworth. JC is currently attending Lee College, majoring in general studies. She scored a three or higher on three exams, and JC is the daughter of Dr. Joseph and Janae Farnsworth. <laughs> Next, we have Octavio Hatch. Octavio is a senior and plans to attend Lee College, majoring in creative writing. He scored a three or higher on three exams. Octavio is the son of Keith and Mary Hatch. Next, we have the family of Juan Rios. Juan is currently at college, and he's attending UTSA, majoring in medical humanities. He scored a three or higher on four exams, and Joshua is the son of Juan and Maria Rios and the sister of Paulina. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Let's give our REL AP scholars who could be with us tonight another big round of applause. We'll take pictures of our group. And then afterwards, students, if you'd proceed to the end. The AP scholars from Sterling High School who are present tonight are Marissa Baguette. Marissa is a senior and plans on attending University of Mary Hardin Baylor, majoring in music performance. She scored a three or higher on three exams. Marissa is the daughter of Mary Miller Baguette and granddaughter of Dr. and Mrs. Wayne Miller. <laughs> Next, we have Abigail de Guzman. Abigail is a junior and plans to attend University of Texas, majoring in neuroscience and microbiology. She scored a three or higher on three exams. Abigail is the daughter of Concepcion de Guzman and, Ab and Abdul de Guzman. Next, we have Priscilla Garcia. Priscilla is a senior and plans to attend Trinity University, majoring in psychology. She scored a three or higher on three exams. Priscilla is the daughter of Yvonne and Zahid Khan. <laughs> Next, we have Samantha Glaze. Samantha is a senior and plans to attend University of Texas at Austin, majoring in architectural engineering. She scored a three or higher on three exams. Samantha is the daughter of David and Kim Glaze. Next, we have Sarah Gagorsik. Sarah is a senior and plans to attend Texas A&M, majoring in business and physical therapy. She scored a three or higher on four exams. Sarah is the daughter of Jean and Alicia Gagorsik. <laughs> Next, we have Conley Laird. Conley is a senior and plans to attend Texas A&M University, majoring in business administration. He scored a three or higher on three exams. Conley is the son of Kelly and Stacy. Layered. <laughs> Next, we have Joy Lynn. Joy is a junior and plans to attend Harvard, majoring in business. She scored a three or higher on three exams. Joy is the daughter of Cindy Lee. <laughs> Next, we have Amber Mahi. Amber is a junior and plans to attend University of Texas at Austin majoring in biology. She scored a three or higher on three exams. Amber is a daughter of 
Syla Malhi. Next, we have Erica Morphin. Erica is a senior and is undecided on where she's going to attend college, but plans to major in biology. She scored a three or higher on three exams. Erica is the daughter of Jose and Erica Morphin. <laughs> Next, we have Karis Sakwo. Karis is a junior and plans to attend University of Alabama, majoring in pre-med or business. She scored a three or higher on three exams. Karis is the daughter of Lillian and Scott Sockwell. Next, we have Angela Talent. Angela is unable to be here tonight. She is attending Baylor University, majoring in secondary math education. She scored a three or higher on four exams. She, she is the daughter of David and Susie Talent. Accepting on her, on her behalf is her mother, Susie Talent. <laughs> Next, we have Emily Thomas. Emily is a senior and plans to attend the University of Texas at Austin, majoring in business. She scored a three or higher on four exams. Emily is the daughter of Stephen and Sherry Thomas. <laughs> Next, we have Erica Zabata. Erica is a senior and plans to attend Our Lady of the Lake, majoring in biomedical science. She scored a three or higher on three exams. Erica is the daughter of Ramiro and Mary Zapata. Let's give our RSS AP scholars who are with us tonight another big round of applause. Students, if you would, if you'll proceed to the end of the recognition line. Until Carrie says so. <laughs> She's boss. <laughs> okay. Fifteen students throughout the district qualified for what is called AP Scholar with Honor by earning an average score of at least 3.25 on all AP exams taken and grades of three or higher on four or more of these exams. The AP Scholar with Honor from Goose Creek Memorial High School who are present tonight are Yukarsh Sharma. Yukarsh is attending University of Texas majoring in biology. He scored a three or higher on 10 exams. Yukarsh is the son of Vinay and Kumar Sharma. The AP Scholar with Honor from Lee High School that are present with us tonight is Lee Seth Mendoza. Lee Seth is a junior and plans to attend Brigham Young University, majoring in athletic training. She scored a three or higher on four exams. Lisette is the daughter of Sylvia and Amador Mendoza. <laughs> Next, we have Madeline Poulan. Representing her tonight is her father, Mr. Robert Poulan. Madeline is unable to be here tonight. She is attending McGill University in Montreal, Canada, majoring in neuroscience. She scored a three or higher on eight exams, accepting on her behalf as her father. The AP Scholars with Honor from Sterling High School who are present with us tonight are Bryn Benoit. Bryn is a senior and plans to attend University of Texas majoring in business. She scored a three or higher on four exams. Bryn is the daughter of Brent and Christy Benoit. <laughs> Next we have De La Marcus Constance. De La Marcus is a senior and plans to attend Ringling College in Florida, majoring in computer animation. He scored a three or higher on four exams. De La Marcus is the son of Mary and Max Constance. <laughs> Next, we 
Next, we have Natalia Martinez. Natalia is a senior and plans to attend Mississippi State University majoring in biology. She scored a three or higher on four exams. Natalia is the daughter of Guillermina Martinez. <laughs> Next, we have Kavish Papalia. Kavish is a junior and plans to attend University of Texas at Austin majoring in business. He scored a three or higher on four exams. Kavish is the son of Manisha and Sanjay Papalia. <laughs> Next, we have Cesar Preto. Cesar is a senior and plans to attend University of Texas at Austin, majoring in biomedical engineering. He scored a three or higher on four exams. Cesar is the son of Ruth and Cesar Preto. <laughs> Next, we have Aaron Rodriguez. Erin is a senior and plans to attend University of Houston and is undecided on her major. She scored a three or higher on four exams. Erin is the daughter of Jose and Maria Rodriguez. All right, let's give our AP scholars with honor from Goose Creek Memorial, Lee and Sterling, a big round of applause. students throughout the district qualified for the AP Scholar with Distinction Award by earning an average score of at least 3.5 on all AP exams taken and scores of three or higher on five or more of these exams. Once your name is called, please remain at the front uh, to take a picture. The AP Scholars with Distinction from Goose Creek Memorial who are present tonight are Hector Andres Amador. Hector is unable to be here tonight, but is attending Stanford University, majoring in mathematical and computational science. He scored a three or higher on 10 exams. Accepting on his behalf is his sister, Stephanie Amador. <laughs> Next, we have Trenton Carr. Trenton is a senior and plans on attending Rice University, majoring in horn performance. He scored a three or higher on six exams. Trenton is the son of Jeffrey and Megan Carr. The AP, <laughs> the AP scholars with distinction from Sterling High School who are present with us tonight are Ayush Agrawal. Ayush is a senior and plans to attend Rice University and MIT majoring in chemical engineering. He scored three or higher in, on seven exams. Ayush is the son of Unja Agrawal. <laughs> Next we have Adolfo Amador. Adolfo is unable to be here tonight, but is attending Rice University majoring in biochemi biochemical molecular biology. He scored a three or better on 11 exams. Accepting on behalf is his mother. Next, we have Andrew Beck. Andrew is a senior and plans to attend UT Austin, Baylor, or the Naval Academy and plans to major in mechanical engineering. He scored a three or higher on six exams. Andrew is the son of Don and Christy Beck. Next, we have Andrew Duran. Andrew is attending Lamar University, majoring in mechanical engineering. He scored a three or higher on seven exams. Andrew is the son of Sarah and Joseph Duran. <laughs> Next, we have Rachel Lahowitz. Rachel is attending Texas Tech University with a double major in microbiology and honors arts and letters. She scored a four or higher on 11 exams. Because of the scores and the number of exams, she will be recognized in just a moment for an additional honor. Rachel is the daughter of Chris and Ann Lahowitz. <laughs> Javi Wynn is a senior and plans to attend Stanford University, majoring in electrical engineering and business management. She scored a three or higher on eight exams. Javi is the daughter of Jennifer and Chuang Nguyen. <laughs> Next is Brandon Ratliff. 
Brandon is a senior and plans to attend University of Texas at Austin, majoring in geography. He scored a three or higher on six exams. Brandon is the son of Marlon and Georgina Ratliff. All right, let's give these students another round of applause. Students in the district qualified for the National AP Scholar Award by earning an average score of four or higher on all AP exams taken and scores of four or higher on eight or more of these exams. This is the highest AP award granted to students in the United States. We are pleased that at least one of these students could be with us tonight, and she's already been recognized once. It's Miss Rachel Lahowitz. Rachel, please come forward. Congratulations, AP Scholars. And if you are a parent or a family member who's here tonight, would you please stand? We'd like to recognize you. Also, do we have any AP teachers or counselors here? AP teachers or counselors, they dedicate a tremendous amount of time, effort to this whole process. Thanks, Brian. And uh, in closing, we want to say congratulations to all of you, and that's a record-breaking year. Nice job.
I'll wait a moment if you don't mind. Good evening. I wish to thank the board for giving me this opportunity to speak. I again rise to speak to you concerning the proposed start times for Goose Creek Consolidated Independent School District. Over the past two years, this has been a subject that has been debated, debated time and time again. Last month, I spoke to you concerning this topic and how the students and teachers of Lee High School <coughs> felt about the subject and how they disapproved of this idea. In addition to what I stated, the idea of their little brother or sister standing waiting for a bus at 6.30 in the morning is not a happy one for a parent or a sibling alike nor is the idea of an elementary student coming home to an empty house. During this time, I've heard of ideas to have after-school care for elementary kids who have no one to come home to to watch them. But then the parents would be charged for what, for that, and many of our population cannot afford, thereby hurting the public. As a parent of two Lee High School grads and as a teacher, as far as our students at Lee High School, they do not wish for this time change. I reported last time that 67% of our students said they would not participate in extracurricular activities if the time changed. It was also reported that approximately 70% of teachers at GCM stated they would look outside the district for positions, thereby hurting Goose Creek due to loss of experienced teachers. Now I understand that the board is considering adding a zero period for those students who may wish to come early and have early dismissal. Doesn't that defeat the purpose? Also, if a zero period is included, how will students arrive at school at that time? Doesn't that mean that those who can afford to drive will be able to have early release? Doesn't that exclude those socioeconomic levels who cannot afford to drive or have people driving to school who do not have driver's license. Also, if a zero period is added and teachers are required to teach extra credit level courses, will that not inflate the district's budget by approximately 12.5%? On Lee campus alone, that would be an additional district cost of approximately $1 million. Taking a base salary of $50,000 times 12.5% times approximately 150 teachers. Then if we add the other two schools, we're talking close to $4 million annually to the district budget. If a zero period is added, would that lower the student-teacher ratio to the point that human resources could come and say, you have too many teachers, thereby cutting jobs? These are all questions that must be taken into consideration before making this drastic decision. I ask that you please listen to your teachers, listen to your parents, Listen to your students, listen to your district committees, listen to your parents, and above all, please vote no on this proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lewinta. Our next speaker is Yin Rabe. Good evening. My name is Yin Rabe. I'm the Houston area chapter leader of the national organization Start School Later. We are a coalition of health professionals, sleep scientists, educators, parents, students, and other concerned citizens dedicated to increasing public awareness about the relationship between sleep and school hours and to ensuring school start times are compatible with students' health, safety, and equity in education. The early bird gets the bad grade because waking up students at 6 a.m. is the biological equivalent of waking an, an adult at 4 a.m. I would like to address the cost and benefit analysis of starting a school later. Teachers, students, and parents are saying that money for transportation costs needed to start school later can be spent, better spent in more needed areas of the school district's budget. What is more important than the health and safety of students and faculty members and students' academics? What good would be building new schools that contained sleepy and tired students and teachers? 
According to Alison Chappelle in her article, Sleep is Healthy, a simple old idea with big consequences. She stated that school is an easy way to improve health. It is a low, it's a, it is a low hanging fruit. We cannot afford to let rot. The way to allow teens more sleep is to let them sleep later. Researchers at the Brookings Institution, a nonprofit public policy organization whose mission is to conduct in-depth research that leads to new ideas for solving solutions facing society at the local, national, and global level, estimates that the ratio of benefits to cost is $9 to $1 for, starts for a later start time. In policy terms, fruit does not hang lower than this. Starting school later enables students to sleep later and therefore arrive at school more ready to learn. Starting school later will improve graduation rates, students' health, safety, and academic performance. When translated into earnings, the average student who starts school later would make about $17,500 more over the course of her life. These lifetime earnings are substantially more than the cost of hanging, of changing transportation systems. In Paul Kelly and Clark Lee's article entitled, Later Education Start Times in Adolescence, Time for Change, they stated that there appears to be no argument for keeping early start time that is supported by scientific or medical studies. And this may make it difficult to defend current practices. With 90% of our students not getting enough sleep, at the start time of 7.15, indicates the scale of potential problems arising from negligent suits. Lastly, TEA's insurance for retired teachers has become very costly, cited in a very recent Houston Chronicle article. We need to keep our teachers healthy to allow teachers' health insurance and retirement to be affordable. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nicholas Herrera. Um, hello, my name is Nicholas Herrera, and I am um, a student at Sterling High School, and I want to address the later start time. Um, all I've known is waking up at 6 a.m. and getting ready and being at school by 7. I just want you to realize how early that is. I do not succeed in my first two periods like I should be, even if, even if I get more than eight hours of sleep, which in, it, which in fact is rare for most students, I still feel kind of drowsy and not fully awake. Now, I can't speak for every student because I do not, because I, I do know some who do fantastic across the board, but many dread their first period. My grades, my first period are not the best compared to many of my other periods, and I, ex and I excel in everything, I'm very involved. I'm in the top of my class. Like my first periods are what's killing me and holding me back. And you know what? It there's only one way to put it. It sucks. Imagine what students could be capable of with the later start time, when the sun is fully out and everyone just feels ha healthier and happier. And I also want to recognize that it's not just for the students; it's for the teachers as well. They too can benefit from this. Um, now, just to keep it short and simple, this topic was brought up to better our district, and I do believe that y'all have the best intention for our district, and this could be a really good opportunity to pick up our game with things. I have attended meetings. I have talked to Superintendent O'Brien, Student Council, and we have consulted with it. Many do disagree with the later start time. Um, However, sometimes the best things are unfavorable, and this happens to be one of those things. But I just want you to know that I do not just speak for myself. I speak for many. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Okay, we will now move to agenda item number five, a public hearing regarding Senate Bill 693, Student Transportation.
Good evening, board members. Superintendent O'Brien. I'm Doug Price, and here with me is Mr. Walter Schott. To give a little history on our public hearing, why we're here for the public hearing, in 2007, the 80th legislature passed House Bill 323, which required all school districts to purchase buses after September 1st to have three-point seatbelt horns. After September 11th, all the buses had to have any buses that we chartered or pulled in had to have the three-point horns also for all passengers and operators, and this was contingent on state funding. Now, Senate Bill 693 amends the current law relating to the three-point seatbelt system on all buses that transport school districts, school children within the district. Senate Bill 693 requires three-point seatbelt horns on all new buses purchased by school districts that are model 2017 or newer and would apply for school activity buses, multifunction school buses, activity buses, or school chartered buses. This brings us to the hearing where we are tonight. Basically, Senate Bill 693 also modifies the act of the, I can't even say that word, the three-point seatbelts requirements, which would, this is where it would not apply. Any bus that is 2017 or earlier or a later model bus purchased by a school district whose board of trustees determines that the school district's finances could not support the purchase of a bus with three-point seatbelts, provided that the board votes on such a determination in a public hearing. To kind of put that into context, if this bill is enacted in our school district, and there's a broad spectrum of whether or not the bill is enacted at our school board or other school boards, there's a whole gambit. Basically, what the Senate bill did was take the funding option, take it off the state's responsibility, and put it right back on the local school district. Over the next five years, we have, it would cost us approximately $4 million additional. I don't have that on the slides. But just as an example, for our replacement buses that we need to buy over the next five years, that would require us to purchase additional buses due to limited seating on it. And that's the number one reason why most districts cannot afford such a costly bill. It's an unfunded mandate. Can you wrap up, Ron, please? Yes, sir. Thank you. Before we get to the public comment, I'd like the board to make comments as to what they would like to change. Does anyone have any comments to make regarding the Senate Bill 693? I just want a point of clarification. It says that we have to vote during the public hearing, so we would have to vote now? No. No, we just have to have a public hearing before it comes to a vote sometime, at any time, after the public hearing. Prior to us purchasing any future buses. What I'd like to point out is, and I think you just got glossed over, that the original bill was contingent upon state funding. What this new Senate bill did is it basically makes it an unfunded mandate from the state on the school district. So once again, it's a burden of the state being placed on the local districts to support a bill that they did not fund. I just wanted to make that comment. Since this is a public hearing, if we have any members of the audience that would like to address the board or make comments about the presentation that was made, we invite you to come forward now. Having nobody stand up or raise your hand, we will then close this public hearing at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're pretty much done. Moving on to agenda item number six, approval of minutes from the December 11, 2017 regular board meeting. These minutes were included in your packet for review. I'd like to move for approval. Second. We have a motion from Mr. Laredo, a second from Mr. Pete Poppe. 
to approve the minutes as presented from the December 9, 2017 meeting. And according to the attendance sheet, all seven board members were present. Any discussion? All in favor of approval, please raise your right hand. Item passes six in the affirmative with one absent. Agenda item number seven, discussion items. We have two superintendent's reports. Mr. O'Brien, you may proceed. Yes, sir. Dr. Duarte will be having a team to come up and present on the quarterly instructional initiative overview. The item that they'll be presenting on this evening is instructional rounds. And she will probably allow the team to introduce themselves. And they will be sharing with you testimony as to how instructional rounds has impacted their campuses. I believe we have two campuses here this evening. Is that right? Yes. We have teachers from Van Willis Elementary School and Baytown Junior School. We have one campus that is in their second year of instructional rounds. And we have our junior school that is their first year of instructional rounds. And the teachers are going to talk to you about the impact on this initiative that's in year two for the district. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us here tonight. My name is Deborah Silverberg, and I'm on the instructional rounds team at Baytown Junior School. This is our first year doing instructional rounds. And we'd like to thank Dr. Duarte so much for including us in giving an overview to you of what this program involves. To give you just a little background on myself, this is my seventh year at Baytown Junior as choral director, my 14th year in Goose Creek, and my 19th year as a teacher. I'm a product of Goose Creek schools. I've seen a lot of educational initiatives. I am genuinely excited about this. This takes a whole new approach to centering instruction on student achievement. And I'm very excited to introduce it to you. So we'll start with the what, the why, and the how of instructional rounds. So in a nutshell, instructional rounds is a data-driven, results-oriented method of improving instruction by identifying and analyzing student action in the classroom. So we want to look at what it is versus what it isn't. When we began our training, we had a lot of sort of preconceptions that proved to be very false. So just right off the bat, instructional rounds is adult learning. It addresses identified student learning problems. It is collaboration, dialogue, and critical thinking. And it's about providing the attention and support that teachers deserve. It is not a teacher evaluation tool. It is not a method of fixing teachers. It is not a checklist. And it is not test preparation. Rounds does not tell us how to teach. Rather, it is designed to tell us how our students are learning and gives us opportunities to address areas of need, areas where we need improvement. This is not selling a philosophy or a set of strategies. What we do in instructional rounds is we break down data from normal classroom instruction. And we provide the campus with a clear picture of what students are really doing day to day. So looking at the why, rounds provides an opportunity for us to collect data about teaching practice separately from any evaluation process. It allows observers to collect data from a variety of educators across a campus and identify common strengths and weaknesses. We call those the trends on campus. Rounds allows the faculty to see data on campus goals based on what is happening in its own classrooms. Ultimately, instructional rounds is a tool that we can use to improve student outcomes. And we understand that good teaching does not happen if students aren't learning. We have to work together to find a more effective way to improve student learning. So for me, the biggest why is that using instructional rounds, administrators can now set very specific and relevant goals for students and find support and professional development that is targeted to those campus specific goals. So now I'll turn it over to Sarah to continue. How are you? I'm going to go over the how process. The campus is in charge of selecting their instructional rounds team. And this team can be comprised of any combination of campus staff members. The Baytown Junior staff, as you can see on the picture, is fun. It's comprised of the principal on our campus, Matt Bollinger, 
Liz Johnson and Charlotte Bigler are campus instructional specialists. Vicki Valio is an ELA instructor, and myself, Sarah Hernandez, and Deb Silverberg are both fine arts teachers. So there's a nice collection of people that are on this committee meeting for us. Um, instructional rounds. Um, you have the process is identifying a problem of practice, which is um, an area of concern regarding student learning. There is a data collection process where the, the instructional rounds teams go into classrooms and use formal and informal observations in order to gather information. There is a debriefing where we create an artifact where it is data driven and it is strictly anonymous, which is very important to the teachers to know that their names are not being spread about in these artifacts. Once we make it to the debrief, it is classroom one, classroom two, and it ends that way so that when it goes back to the teachers, they don't see their names. They don't know what was done. They just see the results of what we were gathering in the information. Um, and after all of that, you get to the next level of work. So the problem of practice is developed in the campus IR teams and it's based on the data that is um, from their campus improvement plan. It needs to be directly observable by the staff and administration. It um, is actionable and can be objectively quantified. It connects to a broader strategy of improvement and it is also what they consider high leverage. Is it worth the effort of going in and fixing that? Is it going to have high impact on student learning? Um, the problem of practice at Baytown Junior, this is just an example, is that multiple uh, data sources show that students do not fully engage during lessons or class discussions in a way that demonstrates high levels of learning. Student talk is usually limited to short one to two word responses and students do not often articulate or demonstrate what they are learning. After you have your problem of practice, you can come up with your theory of action, which is what you can anticipate uh, regarding student achievement if the problem of practice is addressed. An example of a theory of action is what we have at Baytown Junior, and that's um, if students are able to articulate and demonstrate their learning, then student engagement and motivation will increase. Uh, this will create a culture of ownership, empowerment, and, and academic success. The collection rounds um, is comprised of two types of rounds. There are the network rounds and the campus rounds. The campus rounds uh, involve your local campus our IR team, and it may take place several times per year, and it's, you can schedule it when you want and when you think it's necessary or relevant. They are less formalized, but you are still able to collect uh, data for use in your problem of practice. And they, they have pop everywhere. I just can't say it. I say problem of <laughs> practice, but you'll hear pop a lot. Anyway, <laughs> that's what it is. Um, the network rounds take place twice per year. They involve uh, the IR team members from across the district, and then they come to produce those artifacts that are related to the data collected on these visits and are left at the campus to be analyzed by administrators and teachers and to come up with what they're going to do with that data that's been collected. So in the data collection process, um, observers scribe everything that they see. The teachers go into four classrooms on a campus, spending a total of 20 minutes in each classroom. Um, and when they, sub when they scribe everything, this includes not only the words being said, but it also includes who initiates the questions. Are the responses by a boy or a girl? Um, how much wait time is given for responses? And, and all of this stuff is comprised in our data collection. Uh, observations are to be specific, word for word, if possible, and relevant. And because of the limitations of real-time note-taking, a large team ensures that more data is documented. So when we go into the debrief room, we're s several of us have incomplete sentences. But you find as you share your information, as I start one sentence, somebody else says, oh, well, I, I caught that, but I only caught the end of it. So really, we were getting a large collection of information that was very cohesive in the end in that debrief room. And speaking of the debrief room, the, uh, the rounds teams gather to compare their notes. Each team reviews their transcriptions of the day and then creates an artifact that gives a graphical representation of data collected so that the trends and patterns are displayed in a concise and user-friendly format. Which brings us to the artifact. This was the artifact that we made in our training over the summer when we did uh, some practice observations. You can see we took a lot of pride in making it very pretty. But what it does is it takes the most relevant data uh, that applies to the problem of practice and puts it in a form where you can glance and see what the most, where the trends were. What did we see on the campus that will affect the next level of work and the further refinement of the problem of practice for the next year. Now, 
we leave the artifact with the campus. Each team creates their own. But all of the other products, the notes that we take on the observations, everything else remains on the campus with the campus administration, and it's shredded. So the process is completely confidential, and nothing can ever come back to emerge at a later time. This is strictly for use in improving instruction, examining the data. That's it. After the debrief and the artifact creation, we talk about the next level of work. Van Willis is going to talk more about that because they've actually reached that stage in their process. Baytown Junior, we have our observation, our network rounds visit in two weeks. So we haven't gotten to this point yet. We're really looking forward to it. But to wrap up our part of the presentation, these were the main concepts that really stuck with us after the training and have proven to be the most important parts of the process to us so far this year. So this isn't an audit or a checklist. It's an observation focused on the student learning much more than the teacher instruction. This process separates the practice of education from one's personal identity. When we identify and critique practice, it is not the same as a personal criticism. And it's necessary to the development of shared practice to learn to view what we do as educators as a learnable, teachable skill rather than some sort of inborn talent. Confidentiality in the process is absolutely non-negotiable. To tell you the truth, the visits happen so quickly, I could not tell you the names of the teachers that I've observed. I can say, oh, remember that one in the math class? But I couldn't even tell you what the teacher looks like most of the time because I'm so focused on what those students are doing and getting as much of it recorded as possible. The instructional rounds team knows that the trust of the faculty is essential to the process and will not betray that trust. Shared understanding of high-quality instruction is essential for improvement. Data does not include the who, but it focuses on what. The data distributed to the faculty will not ever be traceable to a single teacher. We work very hard to ensure that. And the focus of all instruction should be on maximizing student learning and success. So we try to make sure that everything in this process is about the kids. The kids are first, and if the kids are successful, then it's good. So now we'll go to Ben Wallace. Okay, we're the Ben Wallace team. I'm Wendy Goodman. I'm the campus instructional specialist. And then on our team, we also have our principal, Renee Meyer, and our assistant principal, Beverly Johnson. And then Ebony Porch is a third grade teacher, Jennifer Starr is a first grade teacher, and Lenore Anderson is a second grade teacher. So we have various positions on our team as well. And we wanted to share with you just kind of how the process has played out for our campus the last couple of years. So I have a sample folder for you guys. So we started our rounds in 2016. Last year was our first year. And we followed the same process that Baytown Junior just described to you. We established our problem of practice. We had a network visit, a site visit. We reviewed the data with our teachers. And last year we asked for volunteers to participate in the site visit for the big group to come and watch you. We asked for volunteers. And last year we had more EQs and we collected a lot of data last year. And so we reviewed that through our ILT and the ILT took it back to their teams. And then we did internal rounds in the spring. And so from those internal rounds, we kind of focused our EQs. We decided to have fewer, more focused like data that we were looking for. And it was more specific so that we could get exactly what we were looking for so that we could provide the professional development for our teachers. And we really liked that. So we carried that over to this year. So when we did our site visit this year, what you have in your hand is the folder that the network gets when they come to our campus. So our problem of practice stayed the same. Our theory of action stayed the same. But we streamlined our essential questions and our descriptive evidence so that we could get that more focused data. So this year we assigned teachers who were going to be observed for the network visit because we wanted a more comprehensive look at our campus. So every grade level was observed except kinder just because it didn't work out with our schedule. So it was assigned this year, whereas last year it was volunteer. So when the network comes to our campus, this is what they get. They get this folder. And if you open your folder, you can see that we 
kind of a flyer that tells them about our campus so that they can get familiar with our campus. They get a schedule for the day. And then this is the important piece of paper that you kind of go over and over and over when the visit, when, when you're there. You, you read it, you make sure you understand what the campus's problem of practice is. We discuss it, everyone asks questions so that we're sure that everyone is gathering exactly the data that the campus is looking for so that they're getting exactly what they need and can provide the uh, professional development for their campus. And um, then behind there, we just kind of, we have some pictures of our artifacts that we got. Our site visit was early in the year. So these are all the, all six of the artifacts that we got from our site visit. So you can kind of see what it looks like. It is very anonymous. It's a snapshot of your campus. It's not specific to the teacher at all. It just gives us the data that we need for our campus decisions. And then the network gets blooms because some of our questions asked um, them to level questioning. And then they get their schedule. And then the other important piece of information that we get from the teams is this last paper here. It's the um, analysis and next level of work. So the team gets together and they kind of take all of this that they, they gathered in the day. They put it on a sheet of paper, but they also get to make some recommendations for um, some observations that they made that maybe we had not discussed that the campus might would want to know. And then also like some short term tar targets and next level of work, they get to get recommendations. And this was really great for us. This year in particular, they gave us some ideas. Some different people on the network team gave us some ideas that we're really taking and using in our PLCs and to do professional development for um, <coughs> our campus. So that's, that's my part. I'm sorry, I'm going to tell you to keep going. Next one. Okay. All right. There we go. Next one. Okay, so the way that the rounds teams present the data to the teachers who participated on our campus is simple. Um, we have a first we presented to the participants who actually were a part of the rounds process. So these are the teachers who were observed. So we'll gather to, gather with the rounds team and those teachers who observed and present and post all of the artifacts. So for example, we had our meeting in the library. So we um, had all of the artifacts posted and then we just did a nice little gallery walk and then we had a brochure that kind of streamlined all of the artifacts together. So then our CIS, she comes in and she gives us examples and tells us how to read, read the data that was presented to us. Because of course when you're coming in there and you're looking at all these pie charts and post-it notes, it can be a bit overwhelming. But we do let the teachers know that one, no one is rep no names are disclosed. Everything is strictly confidential and it's not an evaluative process. I think that was our number one issue was that we kept feeling like there's four people coming into a classroom observing me. What are they thinking of, it, of me? Are they judging me? Mm -hmm. So we let them know off top that it's not. So once we get through the entire gallery walk, we take um, we have an open discussion. So we'll talk about, hey, you know, we may have seen our problem of practice stronger in this class. Oh, we may have seen some um, more EQs going on in this class, things like that. And then we also talk about those debrief forms that you see. Um, I think when we have this open discussion and this open dialogue, it creates, you know, a more sense of community. And I know being, you know, a second year teacher, I'm learning every day from this process. I'm learning from the observations, I'm learning from the artifacts that we have and the way that we present the data. It helps us learn um, and create an open dialogue amongst each other. Um, that's about it. And then we move to the next level. And in the next level, that's when we evaluate what we need to do to advance Banuelos. Um, as a 25-year uh, teacher, <laughs> I've learned that this has been quite beneficial for me because uh, it allows the CISs to get, look at the information that has been gathered and then decide what they feel that they need to bring to the table to help us as educators better educate our students. So this is our drive for our uh, professional development uh, through the CISs presenting during our faculty and staff meetings. Our teachers are being surveyed and asked what can we do to better serve you? And then the teachers have input on, I need you to bring this workshop mm -hmm. because it would help me bring higher level questions to my students so that I may get higher level answers. Um, we also, as teachers, meet uh, PLCs and planning 
in those POCs and planning meetings, we sit down and we talk about this work for me. And this is how I got my student. And I did this question to get a higher level answer out of them. And we share those things mm -hmm. to make us a stronger campus. So we collaborate with each other and promote helping each other and it creates a, a greater bond on that campus. As far as instructional strategies, uh, we, like I said, we share as a teacher and we work hard together to meet goals. It's not, it take away a lot, I, really all the selfishness. There's no more selfishness. First grade teacher come to me and they would go, hey, I had this great idea and it worked in first grade. You want to use it in second grade? And that brings in a lot of vertical alignment for us. I, as a, a second grade teacher, coming down from fifth, sixth grade to second grade, needed a lot of direction in my life. And I was <laughs> able to go to one of our first grade teachers and admire her doing the in, uh, internal rounds last year. And that was a big help to me to watch a first grade teacher walk through her classroom and how her students interacted with her. And then it, with this year instructional rounds, I'm scheduled to see a third grade teacher. So now I've seen the grade below me and the grade above me, and we're working together as a campus just to get better. <clears throat> From our experience with instructional rounds, we have observed many benefits. As professionals, we are always learning and seeking to improve ourselves. Instructional rounds have allowed us to learn from one another and do just that. Teachers are learning from other teachers. Another benefit that we have observed is the use of questioning strategies. This has made us more aware of how to achieve higher order thinking. When we come together to collaborate after observations, we can determine how the teachers utilize questioning strategies, and it in turn makes us more aware of the importance of using them in the classroom to promote academic conversations. Because of these benefits, every teacher on our campus will vertically align to observe another teacher as a part of our internal rounds on our campus. Thank you for your time. Do you have any questions for our committee? Yes. <laughs> Walk me through a day if you're a team member, okay? You're, uh, uh, let's see, I don't know, not, not the, not, yeah, no one counts, not the, not the network, which I would, the network. Like an internal round? An internal round, yeah. How many of you are doing this and how many teachers do you see in one day? When we do internal rounds, it's the instructional rounds team, which I believe is six of us. Okay. We break into a couple of groups of three, and we might visit four to five classrooms. Each group. Each group. Okay. So we're seeing a total of eight to ten, okay. and then we come together after that, and each observation is maybe 15, 20 minutes. We're not seeing an entire classroom, just a snapshot. And then we get together and, uh, and debrief after that. Okay. I was wondering how you kept that confidentiality, but you're hitting a big enough sample of your campus yes. that it, it right. does stay con it's confidential. It does. It, it actually does work. Who chooses the teachers that get watched? Mr. Ben. Bollinger. Mr. Bollinger. Yes. How about at Ben Willis? Ms. Meyer? Ms. Meyer. Usually Ms. Meyer or our team discusses okay. it. Typically. We're, we're taking the time. And y'all spread the joy throughout the course we of the year? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. And so how often? Once per six weeks? Once uh, per six right now, we did... Uh, Two in the fall, and we're planning on another one uh, before the network visit next week. And then um, I'm hoping that we can do another one before the end of the year. Okay. Now uh, walk me through a network. Who's on this network team? It's several schools together. Uh, we have in our network Crockett Elementary, Clark Elementary, and, <coughs> and ourselves. And so the team from each of those three campuses participates in all three network rounds. And the teams that go into the individual classrooms are made of people from each campus. So. On my team. So we said there'll be one time where the Baytown Junior team will go to Clark and do Clark, and the we, other one's in your network. Yes. Same with Ben Wallace. Who's in your network? Uh, we're in our network. We, we changed from last year. Renee, you want to answer? This year it's Cedar Bio okay. and, and Stephen F. Austin. And Stephen F. Austin, that's it. Okay. And it's all, it also has district people. It, it's our three school teams, and then we also have district specialist on there, so there's, it's a very large number. It, it's probably, I would say, what, six to seven teams. 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 Yeah. Interesting. 
Yes, right. Those were the teams at the top. Exactly. Right. So, Deborah, what are your students doing when you're making rounds? I'm very fortunate that this year I have an assistant director who is fantastic and wonderful, and we make sure that our plans are in place before I go. The rounds are scheduled far enough in advance that I'm able to plan and arrange. I know that that was definitely before when I was chosen to be on this, I did not have an assistant, and that was definitely a factor in whether or not I should be on this. I have to say, though, the benefit that I've gotten to my personal instruction has made it well worth it. I've seen techniques in my classroom visits to the other campuses that I've already been able to utilize in my classroom, and it's definitely made me a far more confident and versatile classroom teacher myself. So I think it's well worth the investment of time. What about a non-specialist classroom teacher, second grade teacher? How about you, Jennifer? Well, I think being able to go in other classrooms, in another elementary, and just seeing their strategies, even though you are just collecting the data, it just gives you good ideas and makes you more self-aware. Okay, I need to do more of that in my classroom. What are your students doing? Are your students with a sub while they're gone? Yes. You just prepare. And like you said, we're told far enough in advance, but we create quality. There are no surprise walkthroughs. They're all planned. Not for us, no. Do the folks know you're coming? The individual teachers? That's somewhat at the campus's discretion. I know that for our first in-house internal rounds, we kind of gave people a heads up. But for the next one, we've informed the faculty when they'll be, but not who we're going to be visiting. However, when it's the network visit, I believe Mr. Bollinger has said he feels it best that we do give those teachers a heads up that they will be visited. Just because I think any of us, no matter how confident you are in your instruction and how prepared you are, seven strangers walking into your classroom unannounced is not going to be conducive to a normal day of instruction. And we want to see normal. Speaking of how confident you are, were you all looking forward to sitting before the Board of Trustees? Ask me in two minutes. We're glad it's over. You've done a very good job. I want to say proud of you. You've articulated extremely well the process. For someone who didn't know what this was about, you've very clearly articulated and walked us through the process. So I can say that I would know what's going on if I see a group of teachers scattering. So thank you all so much for it. Thank you. Before I leave, I want to recognize that they have fellow team members. I saw they had some support back there. Yeah, they have some support back there. It is a campus initiative, not just a few individuals. And then having and supporting the work that they're doing on campus, I think, speaks volumes. And we are proud of our teachers for being able to do this. And that the principal and assistant principal are sitting back there because they have confidence in you presenting us here tonight. So thank you all so very much. Thank you. 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 Th
elementary B starting 45 minutes later at 845 with the junior high starting at 915. When we looked at a number of things globally, as far as the request from not only the board but also the community and administration, this brought it to about a 31 route addition from the current. So as you can see there, total combined routes is 173 on that. And again, we have asterisks down there based upon a seven and a half hour day and a seven and a quarter hour day with those implementation would look like. We look at it as far as a financial picture, what it would take for us to get there. As you can see, we would need to purchase an additional 31 buses and with an annual budget impact of about 1.5 overall. Okay, in order for the district to move forward, we would have to order the buses. The PO would have to be to our vendors by February the 23rd. So we would have to move quickly on that. And as we spoke earlier tonight in the public forum, we would, the public, the forum meeting, we would have to have seat belts on the 2018 models unless the board voted to exempt us on those. The impact per bus would be about 7,000 per bus. But remember, we would have to have additional buses, one third more buses, which means one third more drivers. So that would impact our budget, which would, the impact would have been 1.5. It would go up to about 2.3 million. And for the buses, 3.2 million would go up to about 4.3 million. So, and the main point we have to put in here is in order for the school bus, the school district to exempt itself, we have to have a public meeting, which we did tonight, and the board would have to make that vote. Can you repeat that again, please? To, it's, to the house bill, the Senate bill that we talked about earlier, 693, the board would have to have a public hearing, meeting, which we did tonight, and then the board would have to make a vote, school vote on exempting us from using or purchasing or going forward with the seat belts. We could go with the seat belts as per the Senate bill or the law, or the board could vote and say, no, we don't want to do that. I understand that, but you said it went from 1.5 to 4.3 million dollars. When you add the extra buses that it would require, the numbers that we're at one third more buses. Apparently, the students sit three to a seat. With seat belts, they would sit two to a seat. That's the difference they're talking about. So, so what I believe they're saying, if I get the, on this alternate start time schedule that we just have, the one on the right, the additional 31 routes now would be 40 routes. Correct. One third more. Correct. That's another 10 routes. So it'd be 41 routes. So instead of purchasing 31 buses, we would have to purchase 41 buses. And instead of employing 31 new drivers, it'd be 41 new drivers. Correct. Because of the seat belts. Because of the seat belt law. Right. It really affects us in both ways, not only in our replacement schedule, but also if we add any additional routes every time we do. So that's one reason why we brought it tonight, was so that we could at least have that discussion as a public hearing and for you guys to consider as we move forward. Felt like that was a responsible thing to do all at one time. Mr. Walter Schein, what will it take to hire 31 drivers or 41 drivers? A good leader. Realistically, what we're looking at is we're going to need to increase our salaries to be the most competitive that we can be in our area. And to you, I was telling Mr. Price earlier today, I think if you go to Clear Creek, there's a billboard over there that has their starting ranges above $17 an hour. Currently, we're bringing people in around $15. So we are expected to add to the budget, and that price was included in that annual budget impact. And that is our hope. So you're looking at in the spring proposing a $2 an hour raise potentially for bus drivers? It would probably come this spring, maybe even sooner, because we need to get started as quickly as possible. When, kind of related question, when that happens, are all the other bus drivers brought up? I would hope so, yes. I think that would be the correct answer. So we're currently running 142 routes. How many full-time drivers are on staff right now? We've got 100, and we've lost them. 42. About a little less than 142. Currently, we're about three short. Over the Christmas break, we had three retire. We've got four in the hopper, and then we just had one resign today. So we're break-even right now. 
Are you covering the routes to get to 142? With our office. We have an absentee rate that is about 7.5%, 8% a day. That leaves us about 9 to 12 drivers average a day. And then if we're short, like we are, about three, we cover through the shop, through the office, much like most districts do. You currently have a green light to hire drivers. Correct. Correct. We're hiring as fast as we can. And training as fast as we can. We don't stop. My last comment on it is this is based on a 7.5 hour day. And I just, we lost this. I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. I'm looking at the four tier route option four. The 7.5 hour day, but the bullets at the bottom of the actual presentation, the individual ones, was that we could move, run the schedule 7 and a quarter hour a day, which would, my understanding is we'd get everybody out 15 minutes before the posted time up here. And if we ran a 7 hour day, we would get everybody out 30 minutes earlier than the posted time here, leaving the start times together. One thing I took from the public comments was that everyone was focused on getting out too late. So I thought back to, I love to go back to my old days of teaching. When I started teaching at the high school in 1983, our school day for high school was 8 to 3 p.m. It was a 7 hour day. And currently we're getting out at 2.45. If I were to be in support of a later start time for the high schools, I would not be in support of continuing a 7 1⁄2 hour day because of the exit time for the high schools. I would like to see the high schools get out no later than 3.15 and possibly go back to a 3 o'clock exit time. That's just my feelings on these proposals. If that would happen, that would be an additional, the 7 and a quarter would be 6 days. That means that at the beginning of the year, they would have, this year the teachers had what, 2 weeks before students? 2 weeks and 2 days of exchange days, correct? They had 2 full weeks, but they also had 2 exchange days. If they didn't do those, they had to come back on a Thursday and Friday even earlier than that. Is that correct? So we basically had 12 staff development days and work days before the students came, but 2 of them could have been waived by going to workshops during the summer. So if we were to go to a 7 and a quarter, instead of teachers being in 2 weeks worth of staff development, which is a lot, they would be 1 week of staff development or whatever they do at the beginning of the year, and then the next week or possibly that Friday, they would start, we would either add the 6th day at the beginning or at the end? Right, exactly. If we wanted to do it at the beginning, we would have to do something to waive the start, the state mandated start date of the last Monday of August. We would have to pass some local legislation to waive that law also to get us to bring the teachers in front of students early, get the students there earlier. But that would be my recommendation to bring the students in earlier in August. Many other school districts are doing it. Can I clarify the 2 weeks prior? You've got 2 work days built in, and so that provides 8 days we've got campus days built in along with convocation, so it's not 10 days of just professional development, but there are mandates that have to be provided by the campus and over views and rules, and so I don't want us to think that that's all we're doing within those 2 weeks. Well, I looked at the school calendar closely, and I was kind of taken aback when I found out that our 187 day employed teachers are in front of students 169 days according to the current calendar. And I remember back in the good old days, the teacher was in front of students 175 days. So that's the 6 days that we lost. That's why we went to the 7 and a half hour day. That's my take on this overall situation. Now they go by minutes. Now they go by minutes, but the 175 days at a 7 hour day is the number of minutes they came up with. Or a 7 and a quarter hour day now. I'll take 6 days less of a student. And go 15 minutes longer. I'm of the opinion that the best teaching, the best instruction comes when there's a certified teacher in front of a student sitting in a classroom, rather than teachers being out, being set to go. I think if a student only gets 169 days in front of his teacher, 
compared to 175 days in front of his teacher, I think he would get more instruction with 175 days in front of a teacher. That's a minute and a half. So anyway, my point would be, okay, we talked about cost. That's kind of been the driver from the beginning, which as a CFO, you would think I'd be excited about. I'm actually disappointed about it. You know, the whole goal is what's best for students. It's kind of been my driver for it. But the thing I want to talk about, we talked about cost, talked about shortage of bus drivers. Yet we do something very unique. We pick, we take every student in our district on a bus. Most districts, two-mile radius, mile and a half. So if cost is such an issue, why are we not looking at the potentially revisiting our current rule that we have as far as why are we picking up at zero mile? I mean, we're doing something totally out of the ordinary. So I think if cost is such an issue, there's a whole lot of other variables that can affect that cost and bring that number way down and still put us in line with what other neighborhood schools are doing. So I'm not saying $2 an hour is not the only solution to your problem. You are correct. So that's, you know, that piece. Aren't you also, there's a, on action item three, you're also asking us to waive the seat belt rule. So, I mean, are you telling us that? And my only issue with that is, once again, I think it's, I want to say two things about that. I'm just going to wait until we vote on that. I'm sorry if I interrupted you. But number one, people that are here listening to these numbers, I want you to be very cognizant of the fact that the legislature has basically told us we think seat belts are important, but we're not going to help you pay for it. And not only are we not going to help you pay for it, we're going to make you look like the bad guy by telling you that you're going to sit there and tell everybody that we can't afford them. So we have the safety of your children in mind, but your school boards don't, and that's unfair. That being said, the other thing I wanted to point out, Mr. Walterscheid, you're asking us here, and I don't know if it's you or Mr. Price, but you're asking us to waive it here, but you're presenting us with the information here. You're giving us a worst-case scenario. And so when people give it out there in the media saying we have to get these extra buses and hire these extra people, but you're asking us for a waiver on action item three, whoever is asking for it, the school district is asking for it. So to be fair, it doesn't go from $1.5 to $4 million. I think to be fair, we have to determine the fact that I don't think any school district, well, I'm not going to say all school districts, but most school districts are probably going to vote for this waiver in a public hearing soon. And I think that's an important thing to state because it sends a mixed message to the public, especially when they go out there and communicate this to other people in the community. What it really does is it puts us at a disadvantage of having to choose how many students we're going to transport. Right. And that is an unfair advantage that we have to face. So one of the things, Mr. Walsh, that you shared with me was the evaluation of other school districts, specifically that may choose to employ this Senate Bill 693 or those that have more travel hazard than we do. Correct. Talk a little bit about the length of our routes and the safety conditions of a compartmentalized seating. And this is my opinion, but I don't think there is a right and a wrong answer to this. I think any time you can be safe, you're doing the right thing. The reality of it in our district is that we do keep very good accident data. We do have a somewhat pretty densely populated district where most of our miles are driven at very low speeds. Statistically, we have done very well, as most school buses do. It is, will, and continues to be the safest mode of transportation with or without seat belts. In our situation, as opposed to, say, a district that is much larger than us that has a lot of highway miles and long trips, most of the accidents where they have found that seat belts would provide the most amount of good were ones that were in overturned situations, similar to one you had in Houston, similar to one you had over in Beaumont a number of years ago when the original legislature passed the bill back in the first version. So in our district, what we've experienced has been very low speed accidents. We don't travel a lot of high speed down the highway. Yes, we do hit I-10. The max that we're ever going to go on one of our school buses is 50 miles an hour. Pray to God this never happens, and we pray every day. 
But it really does put us in a quandary of trying to decide, do we transport more? And that's one of the things that came up out of this study was, one of the opponents was, statements was, that they had to make a decision on, if they were going to put seat belts on a bus, were they going to have to reduce the transportation, which would cause a greater risk through car traffic or walking or riding their bicycles to school. And so that's kind of one of those situations where we as a district and you as a board get to make that decision. And that's one of the main reasons we brought it, because we know the situation is, or the decision is coming very quickly. And so we're going to have to make that decision sooner than later. And right now we just, we're going to have to make it. And I don't mean that directly at you. I know that you guys put your time and effort into this. I just think it's important to consider that this is a very hot topic in our community. And, you know, I've seen a lot of numbers that were, I saw somebody put something about $8 million. It's not even near the cost. They're looking at worst case scenarios and causing these incendiary comments. I just want to make sure our public is informed and understand why we do what we're doing. And now, Mr. Laredo, I'd like to point out that the reason that we will be later in the agenda deciding on the seat belt waiver has, is pretty independent of the start time schedule, because we're going to purchase buses at one time or another in the very near future to replace depleted fleet belts. But we're going to, if we pass this, we're going to. But if we pass this, it's going to impact us. Right. That's why I make that statement. How many miles per year will you travel in support? We're running right at almost 3 million. Right at. How long has the district been in a 100% carriage? We've gone back and forth with different administrations over the last 10 years. We've had some walk zones. We've never been 100%. We've never been at a 2 mile rule. Is that what you're asking? What are neighboring schools doing? Neighboring schools, anything from, you've got some that go out to 2 miles. You've got a number of them that go out to a quarter of a mile. When we started looking at what would, what the, I guess the biggest bang, a quarter of a mile wouldn't do as much. You'd have to go greater than a quarter of a mile from school, almost out to a mile, to a mile and a half. My question was, what was the furthest we've ever, what's the most lenient? I know we've never done the 2 mile rule. We've never, we've never done, we've tried to, we've tried to look at walk zones, but we did it more based upon equality in the district. In other words, looking at all across the district, one neighborhood that may be more affluent versus a neighborhood that might not be as affluent and try and make them somewhat level as long as the conditions exist, same conditions existed. I think back in, when we had the cuts back in 2011, I think the furthest walking we had was over in the horse man zone. We provided 2 extra crossing guards there and that went out to about a quarter of a mile for secondary. I think one of the things in determining that though is, is the school. I'll give you an example. San Jacinto, I mean, it's a walking school. But I remember when we were going over that, I guess in 2011, we were looking at situations like De Zavala, I don't know if De Zavala, maybe horse man, where kids were crossing business 146 and it became very unique to that. I think there needs to be looked at, like what you're saying, I think it needs to be looked at at campus by case. Yeah, campus by campus. Because once again, San Jacinto, or you look at something like Asheville Smith, you know, you don't need kids being bused that are, you don't need 100% bused. No, San Jacinto and Asheville would be a couple of the, and Lamar would be the other two. You have a lot of. The other variable was morning AM and PM. Correct. And we do provide a rubric, if you will, whenever we start to look at those and it's widely used in most school districts. I think almost every one of them in the greater Houston and Austin area uses the same rubrics developed about 15 years ago. And to basically provide equality across the district and from one school district to the next. We apply it to our stop boundaries right now, but it is very easy to apply it to the walk zones because it takes the same concepts. And if I remember correctly, when we did the walk zones back in the day, we had an aide or somebody out there that was to help get the kids walk across. Correct. And that was not eligible for transportation funding and that now is. Correct. Okay. Correct. Austin Elementary would be a good example of that right there across. Head around or whatever they call it. On Raccoon. Raccoon. Yeah. Okay. Right. Because we currently have. 
that's close to my home, and there's two crossing guards at Austin Elementary. And we've gone back and transported those students on the other side. But the guards are still there if the kids want to walk or ride their bicycles. And there are some that do. There are some that do. Any other questions? I just have a question about the alternate start time schedule that's presented. Why is it so dramatically different from everything that we've looked at before? Frankly, it's the one we haven't looked at. It is one that we haven't looked at in the past. I don't know. I just kind of felt like this was a crapshoot here. Well, you know. I think never did we discuss splitting elementary A and B by an hour and 15 minutes. I mean, that. And I never would have. If you want to be disruptive to the district schedule, class schedule, that's like the most awful we could even propose. One thing I wanted to look at whenever I looked at this situation, when I looked at this particular scenario, was two things. Number one, how to get the majority of the elementary students to answer that question, students going home by themselves or getting on the bus by themselves, right, and minimizing that factor. Also, the high school getting out earlier, trying to minimize that factor. And then lastly, efficiencies. How can we make it as efficient as we possibly can so that we don't have the incurred astronomical costs? And I think that this one probably does the majority of answering those questions. I never really would have probably stuck my neck out there, but I was on my way up here one day, and I thought, how in the world am I going to get all this done? And the only thing that we hadn't tried was look at that. And so that's where it came from. So I think the charge was to have high school start later. That's the charge. Correct. And then how to make that happen is how this developed. And really, the elementary campuses do act as their own campus, unlike the junior high schools with the extracurricular or the high schools with the extracurricular activities after school. Austin Elementary is part of a greater, broader scope, but it is Austin Elementary versus Bowie Elementary versus San Jacinto Elementary. I do want to ask a couple of questions. We had some public comment today on this, some of these costs. Since it is on the agenda, I want to clarify a few of those comments that were made that were, I just want to clarify a few of those comments that were made. It may not be you. It may be more on the academic side. But number one was they said zero period. Now, I would assume with an 8 o'clock high school start time, zero period would be off the table because that would defeat the purpose. But if you did a zero period, and as I mentioned it last time, if we kept it at 9 or whatever and we did a zero period, the zero period, the comment was made that would be 12.5% increase in salary, which that teacher would just leave after seventh period. There is no additional cost. The teacher would teach zero through seventh. That was what was mentioned, what I mentioned last time. So there were some numbers mentioned that were not, I don't want to say accurate, but I just want to clarify that that was not the intent of the zero period when it was brought up. That's the last one you saw me say. If the teacher came in for a zero period, then they could leave after the seventh period. So there was no additional cost. Still teaching eight periods. Not anything different, just for the teacher. If we go to an 8 a.m., which still isn't really where the research shows that it's best for our students, but welcome to the world of negotiation and compromise. 8 a.m., I would assume that we wouldn't be looking at a zero period with an 8 a.m. I mean, it wouldn't really be on the main thing. I agree with what you stated earlier. Our perception on your comments were that if we started at 9 o'clock, we would consider it zero. 8.45 or 9. It would be similar to what you're saying. We'd have to sort out. Not every child would be eligible or need a zero period. So it would be sorting through the ones that did and the ones that didn't. So it would be a percentage. I could throw out a big estimate, but I mean, right. It would not be half of the students. It would just be the ones that parents who said they had to have school done. That apparently, if they have an after school job, I would assume they have access to a car. So it wouldn't be an issue to go to a zero period. I just wanted to clarify that comment, too, that was made earlier. I think we're going to, I mean, like Jessica, I think we're going to, I don't think this is going to bode well, the public with the elementary being so far apart, but maybe it will. I think it's a step in the right direction for the high school, starting later, but still another half hour of reasonable support of our research. Junior school, you're going to have an issue, unless we 
scale the day back 15 minutes because they're already having a hard time getting to athletic events and extra, extra after school events as it is by getting out at 345, which I was brought up with the program too. But if everybody feels good with something like this, then we can have it at the next meeting. If not, I have no comment, but I'll say that later. I believe they're getting out at 420 now. You said 345. Oh, the, yeah, it's it's 20, I think it's 420, 415 or something like that. It's 420. Yeah, 420. Okay. Yeah. And then again, that with this one, if we went to seven and a quarter, that 445 becomes 430. It's just adding 10 minutes to the end of the day. Okay, but I couldn't, I couldn't see us going any shorter than 715. I, I, can, I can tell you that. And I don't think that's going to be recommended by administration. I, I can tell you at one of the junior highs, it's not 420, it's, it's later, but because of their. They're, the way they stagger dismissal, that's a different discussion for a different day. When, I, when I'm looking at this, um, our current versus our, our alternate, if you, if you break it down by schools, you'll see that mainly elementary B is the one that is getting out 30 minutes later. The rest of them are anywhere between 25 to 15 minutes difference, either earlier or later. Would you put that side by side up then? So off the top um, of your head, what, what would you... Yeah. Where would your geographical boundary be between A and B in the elementary? Would it be a geographical? That's when we would start looking at it. Would not, it would, I don't think we could do it by geographic. What we look at when, we look, when we're looking at this so far, what we've been looking at is current elementary A's with minor alterations. And what I mean by that is our goal is to get as many of those uh, elementary B buses available so that, so that the we can get them, we can turn and burn. So in other words, the closer densely populated campuses that we run transportation for. So if traffic patterns would come into play, a clear example would be Banuelos and Victoria Walker. So Correct. we would run both of those at the same time. This would be a clear example to allow the traffic patterns to clear and have one of the other of those on flip. And, and additionally, when you look at, when you look at Banuelos versus, versus, and we'll just use those as Walker, Walker is a little bit larger surface square square footage to cover, so we would we would more than likely put Benuelos as a B, and I'm looking up back there at my routers. <laughs> put Benuelos as a B because we can get those buses out there, and, and they're not on there very long, and they're getting right back to campus, so they can drop off and go to a next school. And so all of those things, when we look at that, that all starts to play in. Um, and, uh, and, and that's how we, we arrive at it. will be evaluated case, case by case. Right, right. I don't expect a whole lot of changes uh, from A to B. I really don't. It's something they did very well way back when. Yeah, I mean, I'm good. I'm, but I'm just I'm talking to the point to where if this comes up at a future meeting and we're talking about this stuff again, I'm to the point to say, you know, I was. It's not my job, it's not my role as a school board member to be working about schedule. It's start high school after 8.15, don't have anything to start before 7.30, administration, figure it out, bring it back to us. That's kind of where the point I'm at. Because we talk about these every meeting for an hour and nothing gets done. And poor Rick has to go back to his place and reconfigure everything. And we're not, speaking of efficiency, I don't know if we're being efficient, so. But, you know, I think we need to, Make this decision at the next board meeting. Thank you. We'll bring uh, we'll bring that before you at the next board meeting for a vote. Um, but I think it's, I mean, don't beat yourself up because it's a t challenging uh, issue that <laughs> does require deliberation. I agree. But um, appreciate y'all continue to bear with us as we bring it to you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. Guys. you. Thank you. We now move to action item, um, agenda item number eight, action items, A, consideration of consent agenda. With our consent agenda this evening, we have item A1, donation from ATB, item A2, impact early college high school student selection, three, waiver of Senate Bill 693 regarding student transportation, four, award CSP for industrial education equipment, supplies and related services, Five, tax refund. Six, contract for purchase of property. Seven, resolution expressing intent to finance expenditures to be incurred for real property located on Wallaceville Road, Baytown, Texas, 77521. Track one of 58.0619 acres, more or less. And track two, 
residue of 72.5691 acres easement along north side of Highlands Ranch subdivision from local funds with the intention of a future reimbursement from bond funds. Eight, budget amendment for the appropriation of funds to purchase real property located on Wallaceville Road, Baytown, Texas, 77521 Track 1. Of funds to purchase real property located on Wallaceville Road, Baytown, Texas, 77521 Track 1 of 58.0619 acres, more or less, and Track 2 of 72.5691 acres from the general fund with the intention of a future reimbursement from bond funds. Number nine, cancel the May 28, 2018 regular school board meeting. Number 10, employment of Randy Gunter to investigate a personnel matter. Yeah, it's it's an agreement of services. Yes, it's an agreement of services. It's not employment, it's an agreement of services. That's what the thing is. All right, before we have any discussion, does anybody like to pull any of the 10 consent agenda items for individual consideration? I have a question about 7 and 8, and I know I can ask a question now. It will help me. Are we buying one or two pieces of property? One. The other property is an easement included with the purchase. Okay, thank you. I wanted to clear that up in my mind. All right, does anybody else want to pull anything from the consent agenda? Hearing none. Let's go ahead and pull one. Okay, pulling number three. Any others? Okay, we'll entertain a motion at this time. I'd like to move that we can we approve consent agenda items 1, 2, and 4 through 10. We have a motion from Mr. Laredo, a second from Mr. Pete Poppe to approve consent agenda items 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Is there any discussion on that motion? Hearing none, I will call for a vote. All in favor of the motion, please raise your right hand. Motion carries six in affirmative, one absent. Number three, waiver of the Senate Bill 693 regarding student transportation. Mr. Poppe, the floor is yours. I just want to piggyback on the comments made earlier by Mr. Laredo, as well as the fact that I don't agree that the legislature has painted us, put us in this corner. I don't believe it's research-based. The National Transportation Safety Board has come out and not supported our seatbelts. There's other issues of liability. The bus driver has no way of knowing if a student is buckled in. And if you're in an accident, and whether it's the school's fault or not, and the student is hurt, and they weren't wearing a seatbelt, is that bus driver going to be liable? Is the district going to be further liable? So I just, I think this legislation was not well thought through. I thought we could have done a better job. I appreciate the administration's recommendation that we waive this. And I just want to make those comments. It hasn't been in public meetings. I think we're a little frustrated with this law and how it's been passed and how it went through. Those were just comments. We have no motion on the table at this time. I'd like to move for approval. I'll second. I have a motion from Mr. Laredo, a second from Mr. Pete Poppe, of approving the waiver of Senate Bill 693 regarding student transportation. Any discussion? All in favor, please indicate by raising your right hand. That motion carries six in the affirmative with one absent. Future board agenda items is next on our agenda. I would like to see a report on, like I mentioned earlier, just on the school pickup, you know, quarter mile, half mile, mile, mile and a half, whatever. Transportation impact. Transportation. And just remind the administration about the inter-district report, hopefully in the spring, that I'd ask for in the fall. I mean, I'd expect it to launch itself as soon as we have it. Just a reminder. I get it. Anything else? Okay. Board trainings. Just a reminder, the upcoming, we have the, Ms. Garcia, help me with the name, in Galveston, March 1st, 2nd, 3rd. Governance. 
evidence on March 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. That's board training for us. Anybody else want to see any more board trainings put on the agenda? It's to deal with case law, I believe, and we were invited to have one of our campuses perform possibly at that event. Do you know if they've confirmed that with us or not? There's a possibility that one of our choirs could be singing at that event in Galveston. We'll confirm with you when we know that for sure. And then also I'd like to see on my mind we're blank. Oh, I know there's a bond committee meeting, currently a meeting. We had a meeting, I remember, back in the summer. I believe we had Dr. Nix come in. I'd like to know are we made any progress with the strategic plan so we can tie this with the bond program, our facilities plan, and the business plan in the summer. Just kind of wanted to ask where we were on those things. It's been a while. Okay. Future board meetings. We will need to have, piggybacking on the bond comment, we will need to have a board workshop to hear the presentation from the bond committee. I think they have two more meetings left to finalize their recommendations to us as a board. I would like to set Thursday, January, was it 18th, guys? 18th. 18th as a board workshop at 630. I'm sorry. At 630? At 630, yes, sir. Is that following the rodeo art? Reception at 5, yes, ma'am. I'm looking forward to hearing what the bond committee is going to propose for us to consider. So that's a workshop? It's a workshop, yes. On the bond? Yes. We'll be hearing a presentation from, I guess, the committee chairman and representing maybe Ms. Garcia and Land, I assume. Okay. Are we good to go? Okay. We will now move into closed meeting. Pursuant to the following sections of the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Governmental Code, Section 551.071, 551.072, 551.073, 551.074, 551.075, 551.076, 551.082, 551.083, 551.084, 551.087. No action will be taken while the board is in closed meeting. It is 823. Action was taken while we're in closed session. Returning to our posted agenda, we are on E, consideration of personnel. Mr. O'Brien. The administration recommends that the board approve the election and the resignation as presented. We have a motion for Mr. Pete Poppe, a second for Mr. Ben Poppe to approve one resignation and one elected as presented. Any discussion? All in favor, raise your right hand. Passes six in the affirmative, one absent. Seek a motion for adjournment. Mr. Clem has moved. Mr. Moreto has seconded that we adjourn. Any discussion? Please raise your right hand if you want to adjourn. All in favor? 923.